Hello everybody, my name is Peter Klapper from the School of Biosciences at the University of Kent and in this video clip I want to discuss with you the specificity of an enzyme and what it means actually when we say an enzyme is specific for something. Now we know that enzymes can be specific for either a particular substrate or a particular reaction or both a particular substrate and a particular reaction. Now how would that work? For example, we might have uh, a protein and this protein is taken by an enzyme and broken down into amino acids. If we offer, let's say, DNA to the uh, to this enzyme, nothing would happen. So this particular enzyme, a proteinase, is specific for proteins. Another enzyme, for example, takes sugars and it adds a phosphate to these sugars. So we get a sugar phosphate, for example glucose 6-phosphate. And this enzyme can use different sugars but it always catalyzes the addition of this phosphate here. If we offer the enzyme, say, a protein, The enzyme would not add anything because it is not the right substrate. Uh, in this case here, the, sugar, the, the enzyme is specific for sugars and it catalyzes a specific reaction, namely the addition of phosphate. And of course it can happen that an enzyme only takes glucose and it adds a phosphate, so it adds this phosphate, and we get glucose, let's say, 6-phosphate. And this enzyme only takes glucose, so if we, for example, offer fructose, it would not work, because it's the wrong substrate, and it catalyzes a very specific reaction. It doesn't catalyze the breakdown of the glucose, it catalyzes the uh, addition of this phosphate. Now, how do enzymes actually become specific? And that's uh, something that a lot of people uh, were involved and uh, were trying to figure out. Why is an enzyme specific for a reaction? or a substrate. Before we can answer this question, we have to think a little bit about what an enzyme looks like. So we said usually an enzyme is a protein, and I symbolize that like this. So this enzyme here is a protein, and it has something which is called the active site. So here is the active site. The active site. And in this active site we can bind the substrate. Let me uh, illustrate that here. I want to change the color. So here in this active site we could put in say a substrate like this. Now this would here be our substrate. And then the enzyme does something with it. And the specificity of an enzyme always comes from the shape of the active site. So that our substrate can actually bind into this active site of the enzyme protein. But imagine now, what would happen if we offered the wrong substrate, for example, a substrate 
that might look like this. Would this substrate be able to bind to this active site? Well, I don't think so. So it is this active site that actually dictates what kind of substrate the enzyme can use. What substrate can bind to this active site so that the enzyme can do something with it? Now to understand this particular model, let's assume our active site of the enzyme looks like a log and the substrate looks like a key. So this is what is called the log and key model. And you see the key, the substrate, fits very nicely into the active site, into the log. So this one here is the active site and this one here is the substrate. And both fit together like the lock and the key. But what happens if I use the wrong key? If I use, for example, here my car keys? Well, obviously it would not, well, it might, it might slip in, but it doesn't do anything. So here in this case, the lock and the key don't match. And that is, where we think, or where people thought, that substrate specificity comes from. That the substrate has to match exactly the lock. Now this lock and key model that I just showed you is really great because it explains how an enzyme can have a very specific substrate. But it doesn't explain how an enzyme can be specific for several substrates. So some very clever people came up with a new hypothesis and they said, okay, good, let's assume my face is the enzyme and I have an active site here, that's my mouth. Now I have a substrate, I have a grape here and as soon as this grape comes along and makes contact with the active site, with my mouth, the active site changes its shape so that it can accommodate the grape. So now here I've got the grape, the substrate bound to the active site. So the active site has specificity for grapes. Now what happens if another substrate, potential substrate comes along. Now here I've got a banana and you will agree with me this is very different to a grape. But as soon as the banana comes along it can induce a change in the active site so that the active site now can accommodate even this substrate. Right now. But if the substrate is too different. For example, if the substrate is uh, like this remote control, the active site can no longer accommodate it. So it would not take this as a substrate. So this, what is called the induced fit model, explains how the active site can accommodate certain substrates, but if they are reasonably similar, but if they are very different, these substrates cannot be accommodated. So, to summarize, we said enzymes show substrate specificity and this substrate specificity is due to the shape of their active site. And I've shown you the lock and key model where we have the active site more or less static and rigid and it doesn't move but it explains how certain substrates bind to the active site. However, this induced fit model that I showed you with the banana and the grape explains how different substrates can bind to the active site. So as soon as the substrate comes near the active site, the active site can adopt the right shape to accommodate the substrate. But if the substrate is too different, then of course the active site can't deal with it. I hope this makes sense and thank you for watching.